we have two projects, which are the Colonish Project and the Grampian Exploration Project. The Colonish Project consists of a relatively small scale, high grade gold and silver deposit, which for the last few years, the company has been developing to successfully bring into production. All the while, the Grampian Exploration Project has been quietly working in the way in the background, searching for more gold. Uh, the Colonish Mine sits relatively secluded glen on the outskirts of Loch Lomond on the Trossachs National Park, which you can see is this green area on the map here. Um, it's about an hour's drive north of Glasgow, uh, and the team are mostly locals, or like myself, have moved to the area surrounding Tyndrum and have now become a local. So just on the satellite map here, you can see this is Tyndrum, and there's a little road that gets you up to the Colonish Glen and up to the Colonish Mine, which sits on the hillside of a hill called Ben Hearn. Um, both projects have actually got quite a long history. The Colonish deposit itself was discovered back in 1984 uh, by Edex International. And after the initial discovery of the Colonish vein, there was a few years of drilling to define a resource uh, and the development of an underground adit. And that was to prove that the vein was structurally continuous and to increase the confidence of the gold grades that you see in the drilling. Um, then the project completed a feasibility study and they did initially get planning approval granted, uh, but shortly after that, the gold price fell. You can see that sort of in my picture here. Um, and the project wasn't as economically feasible as before. Uh, a few years later, the Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park was established. Um, and that meant that when Scott Gold took over the project and they wanted to push forwards with the development, uh, they had to resubmit their planning application and modify a few things. Um, such as how the tailings would be managed in order to meet the new standards required by the National Park. And the company did this and successfully gained planning permission. Uh, they also completed a bulk processing trial in 2016 um, to show that you could actually efficiently process the ore and separate the gold. Um, and from that, they auctioned off some ounce gold coins um, and that they sold really well. Uh, and then that pushes us kind of into the last few years. So in 2018, when I joined the company, um, it, shortly after I joined, it secured all of the funding it, that it required. Uh, and it was full steam ahead to build the processing plant, and develop the existing at it so that it was ready for mining. Alongside of that, the price of gold has really shot up. Um, so it's not a bad time to be bringing a mine into production. Um, all the while as well, you can see that uh, there's been some sort of exploration in the background. And at the end of November last year, we officially poured gold. Um, I've just got you a little video here. And this is actually the first bucket of ore going into the crusher. So that's the new processing plant. So the Colonish mine is now in, in production officially and focusing on optimizing all the equipment ready for acceleration of the company's expansion plan. And that's just to increase the production of the rate of ore. Uh, and I've got a couple more photos as well. Yep, so this is the conveyor taking some of the crushed ore on one of our shift supervisors. Um, and then this picture here on the on the right is the shaking tables. So the gold, um, any free gold, which is gold that exists in the ore as little particles of actual gold, um, is separated out by gravity circuit. So um, part of the gravity circuit is a shaking table where it's it's shaken and the gold is separated just because it's heavier than everything else. So in this, you can see two colors. You can see a sort of more goldy color, and that's the gold. And there's a darker color as well, and that's the sulfide galena, which is a um lead or um so that kind of goes to now what we've all gold and we're now producing mine with the with a life of about nine years um but after that we don't want to pack up shop or we want to develop something that lasts a bit longer and is more sustainable for both the local workforce that will have been recruited and trained and working at the mine um but also for the overall community who's sort of supporting a larger workforce 
Um, so the aims are firstly to extend the life of Conanish. That's that that would be good because Conanish is there. We've got a processing plant there. If we found more gold, it would be very easy just to mine more gold underground, take it out and put it in the existing plant. Um, and the other aim would be to find another gold deposit in one of the license areas that we have. Generally, we think that Scotland is a very prospective area, and we do think that there is potential to find another deposit that then has the potential to become a resource. So one of the reasons I say the area is prospective is we already know that it hosts several gold deposits. The Connanish deposit is actually very small when you compare it to the current alt deposit in Ireland, um, and that one hosts about six million ounces of gold. But they both sit within the Grampian terrain. The Grampian terrain makes up part of the Caledonian orogenic belt, um, and that's a belt of rock which stretches out as far as Newfoundland, where I believe Newfound gold is currently getting some pretty exciting results from their ongoing exploration campaign. I think uh, they recently got 13 meters at just over 43 grams per tonne gold. So that's pretty incredible. And it would be quite exciting if we found something like that here, seeing as we are in the same sort of um, geological terrain. And the, the Grampian terrain itself consists of Dalradian age rocks, uh, which were originally marine sediments, which were then metamorphosed and later subject to faulting and intrusive events. So we, a lot of the time are looking at quite deformed rocks which have been subjected to events which alter both their structure and geochemistry. Um, and that results eventually in gold mineralization, which is concentrated in favorable areas. The real question is, where are these favorable areas and why are they favorable? Because in answering that, we'll be able to narrow down where we search for more gold. So to start trying to answer that question, I'm gonna take you back to some very early Scottish exploration and metal discovery. Gold has actually been found in Scotland since the 1500s, but mostly in the way of panning from rivers. Uh, at the time, I think they had a, hundreds of people working on particular areas as sort of like a mini gold rust, searching for nuggets of gold. Um, Scotland also has quite a long history with hard rock mining for metals like silver, lead, zinc and copper. Uh, an example of this can be prominently seen in Tydrum. So if you look out just over the road from the main part of Tydrum, you can see the remains of a lead mine, which was mined on and off for nearly 200 years, producing more than 5,000 tonnes of lead and lesser amounts of zinc. The mining here was uh, following a vein which was made of dominantly quartz with the lead sulphide galena. So that's we see some of that at Conanish as well. I showed you just on those shaking tables. Uh, although this is the largest working in the area that you can see across Tyndrum region, you can see evidence of other smaller addicts and trials where miners were finding and mining out lead, but just sort of in a smaller amount. Um, these are all in proximity to the Tyndrum fault, which is a left lateral strike slip fault. It's quite a prominent feature in the area and has many smaller fractures associated with it, which contain both cataclastic and extensional hydrothermal quartz veins which show that Tyndrum Fault is an important conduit for fluid flow and mineralization. And it's these sort of veins coming off that produce this base metal mineralization. So geologists who first came to the area in the 80s could see that it was interesting from the significant base metal mineralization that you have. You come to Tyndrum, you can see that spoil on the hill, um, as well as the continuous finding of gold flakes and gold nuggets in the local burns. Tyndrum is a really popular place for panners. Um, it just seems to reliably have gold coming out in the rivers. Um, these are two key pieces of evidence which uh, led to further geological investigation into the area for precious metal mineralization. And there are actually two lead addicts right next to Conanish. Um, so here's a picture of me stood on the mother vein, which is a big quartz vein, and I'm stood looking towards um, Conanish. This was a couple of years ago when I first started. Um, and here's a mine engineer. He's actually stood in one of the um, old lead addicts um, and the geologists that first came they could see this and there's also a little bit of mine working on the side where they've taken material out from that addict and they assayed it and didn't find that it was significantly enriched in gold but nearby in that area sort of along the Izani river and things they did find mineralized boulders which assayed it up to 4.3 ounces of gold per ton which is about 122 grams per ton so that's quite a lot of gold Dividing a boulder, and that, that tells you you're quite close to something. Uh, Charlie, I'm sorry to interrupt, but your sound quality is not great. Oh, um, sorry. And I no, it's not your fault. Um, it's just maybe what we could try is just turning your camera off. Okay, and yeah. Then your sound should be fine. Your slides are all fine. It's just a little bit of interference. Thanks.
Okay. Um, so is that okay? Is that better? Yep, that sounds good. Okay. Uh, overall, we've built up a geological map of the area, which still has a few question marks in places. So Graham, you were talking about Jeff Tanner. He's done a lot of mapping there, and we still use quite a lot of his, his mapping work today. Um, there are a few question marks in places, but mainly that's because there's quite limited outcrop in some areas where it's just co completely covered in peat or grass, and you can't actually see to really make very much of an interpretation other than looking at things like the topography to give you any clues. Uh, drilling and trenching define the main part of the conish ore body, which you can see in this little red box here, and this little blue line, that's the vein. And the mother vein, which I was just stood on in the last photo, you can see that here. Um, and that vein sits in uh, a series of formations made up of metasedimentary rocks, including quartzites and schists. Uh, the red line here, that represents the Tyndrum fault, which I just showed you as well. So you can see that this, this mineralization is, is close to the Tyndrum fault, um, all these veins coming off. And if we were to look just off the photo, sort of over here, that's where the Tyndrum lead mine is. So if we look at the Connish vein as if it were slicing through the hill, you can see something like this diagram here. The vein is steeply dipping and it pinches and swells considerably, both laterally and vertically. In some places, it's less than half a meter in thickness, uh, and in other places, it's more than six meters thick. The Connish vein, which contains the gold and silver we call Amin, uh, and that consists of a quartz gang with pyrite, chuck pyrite, and galena. Generally, the gold grades are visually correlated with overall sulfide abundance. So the higher the sulfide concentration, the higher the gold concentration. The gold itself is mostly associated with the pyrite and electrum. Um, so you, you don't actually really usually see gold, but occasionally you can see some millimeter size visible gold flakes if you're quite lucky. Um, we also see a vein which generally doesn't contain any gold and we call that one beamin, and that's because it's a later phase of mineralization which sometimes cuts across the Connish vein. Um, you can see that in this diagram here. Um, and that one is a quartz carbonate gang with significant galena. And so that's the base mineralization that the old lead miners were looking at when they were sort of searching around the area. So if maybe they had mined a little bit further in, they, they'd have found gold. Um, if you were to look at some typical core going through the Connish deposit, this is what you'd see. The host rock uh, of schists and quartzites are in this top core box here. And in the bottom one, it shows you a section of the vein. From this, you can see it has a lot of pyrite in, and in some places it's quite brecciated. Um, it's also, you can see how variable it is because of the sulfide concentration. So there's so much in this part, but not so much in this part. Um, and you can see how it changes even in just tens of centimeters. You can also see some metasomatically altered, uh, altered um, schists here. So you can tell that by this sort of pinky color. Uh, and all this information about Connish is giving us a better idea of the sort of setting that we might be able to find another gold deposit where we might be able to find sort of a number two um, Connish deposit. Oh, and here's a little, little flake of gold. <laughs> So this leads me on to the exploration part of the presentation. The questions are, where do we find the next deposit and how do we find it? To start off with, we have just under 3,000 square kilometers of prospecting area with east from state Scotland to search for gold. In some areas, we do actually have a significant starting point for exploration. For example, there's some very limited historic reports of precious metal exploration drilling in sort of as early as the 60s. And there's also been mineral reconnaissance programs carried out in the past by the BGS um, and other companies. They've completed stream sediment sampling and soil sampling programs. So we have some of that information to look back on. Uh, there's also a wealth of information that's come from people panning over time. So some burns we see reliably having gold in and some places no one's ever really found anything. Um, so exploration isn't always easy and we do have some issues that hamper the effort, especially in Scotland. Uh, one of them is the weather. It's hard to get up uh, a mountain when there's gale force winds howling. It's also not particularly easy to look at rocks when they're covered in snow, although you can complete some activities like drilling, which is what they're doing here in the photo. Um, 
I would say that actually it is easier to walk across bogs when they're frozen compared to when they're all thawed out and soaking wet. Um, so sometimes, sometimes it is a little bit easier. Uh, it's also not possible to get the best stream sediment samples when there's been really heavy rain because the rivers will be in flood and you can't really see anything. Um, we don't actually tend to do much field work during the middle of winter because the weather does get so bad here. But it does provide some quite valuable time for analysing data and getting everything organised for the next year so you can really go for it in the spring. Another problem can be the terrain. There's some swathes of land which are covered in forests, so a lot of land that's owned by the Forestry Commission. Um, natural forest isn't actually as difficult to get to, but the tree plantations can be near on impossible because the trees are all planted so close together uh, and it's difficult to find any outcrop. In the summer, there's usually quite a lot of bracken. Um, it usually just springs up out of nowhere and it can be taller than I am, so that makes it quite difficult to walk anywhere, let alone see any outcrop. So if you're wanting to look in an area that you know bracken could be an issue, it's best to go early spring. Then last year's dead bracken has rotted away a little bit and the new year's bracken hasn't quite sprung up. Uh, there's also very steep terrain to work on. Sometimes you think you can see an interesting outcrop, but it's just not quite safe to get to because it's right on the edge of a cliff. It can also be quite hard work soil sampling on steep terrain. So that's sort of something we have to take into account. So another problem for uh, exploration is glacial terrain. Scotland is a glacial area and a lot of the landscape has been carved out by um, quite large glaciers. And now that they're all melted, what's happened is rocks have been picked up by the glaciers, sort of eaten out of the hillside. And then as the glaciers move, they've been taken along and deposited in different valleys. And in some cases, glaciers have moved rock hundreds of kilometres uh, and they're the things that they deposit are called glacial erratics. Um, and if you find them in the field, you don't necessarily know if they have a proximal source or if they have traveled hundreds of kilometers. So if you found a big boulder and it had lots of gold in it, has it just rolled off the hillside or has that come from really far away and actually doesn't bring you any closer to finding a deposit? So gold bearing rock, you might also not see, but it could be in unsorted glacial tills. So, that could show up as an anomaly in soil sampling because the gold might pick up in the surface above where the rock has been deposited. So a method we would thought we'd try to get over some of these problems was sampling using the ionic leach technique. Uh, and that's a technique that can be used in poor or thin soils and has been shown to work in glaciated terrains. And it can be used in wet areas. So that sounds quite good for Scotland. The way the method works is metal ions are released from a mineralized material and travel upwards towards the surface by advective transport. These ions are then loosely bound to soil particulate surface by weak atomic forces. We then use a specific sampling technique and the lab uses specific chemical ligands to leach the ions from the soil particles. You then do an ICPMS trace element analysis and that's used to determine the concentration of the mobile metal ions which are left in the solution. Um, and that's often in very low concentrations, so parts per billion. Research and case studies over known ore bodies have shown that mobile metal ions accumulate in surface soils above mineralization, indicating that metals are derived from oxidation of the mineralization source. And the lifetime of the ionic state at surface is very limited because they're subject to degradation and molecular binding or fixation into molecular forms by weathering. But as long as the flow of ions is maintained, you can detect them at the surface. But that's a good thing because, because their life is limited, it means that they don't move out by lateral circulation. So they don't come to the surface and then migrate outwards. So that removes the problem of, say, having a halo of mineralization or quite a large area that's mineralized. You sort of get a more um, sharply bounded area, which directly reflects the ore body below. So measuring this surface soils, you can get an anomalous response that reflects the shape of the ore body as well as the characterization of the mineralization. So maybe what other minerals are associated with it, not necessarily just gold. Um, so yeah, we thought well, that sounds great. And the way we thought we'd try it is we trialed it by doing our own calibration study over the Coninish ore body, because if it didn't work over a deposit, which we're mining, then it's just not going to be any use to us whatsoever. Um, so we did it and it worked brilliantly. 
in this box here that denotes sort of the size of the colonish ore body. So that's perfect. That comes up as really high pink splodge. So um, we thought brilliant. But when we did do the study, we originally did a much smaller area. We saw the colonish come up and we also saw these other anomalies appearing. So over the last couple of years, we've just increased the study area and we've also um, rolled out over some other nearby areas that we knew previously had anomalous sort of rock chip and sampling results and uh, looked interesting from just geological mapping. And so now we have these other target areas, uh, which you wouldn't necessarily have known from surface because they're covered by peat and soil. Um, this sort of area here, this is just showing you what the terrain looks like at Kilbridge, which is this soil grid here. It's really steep. So we're still getting like quite good data over areas where the soil is quite poor. So that's also a big bonus because a lot of our areas is quite steep. The other thing is we see quite a good tellurium anomaly, which appears right over Connish. And tellurium we found is a pathfinder element for the gold mineralization at Connish. So if we can see that, we can use tellurium as a pathfinder in our soil sampling as well. So that's been quite good. So as well as doing the soil sampling, we trialed a stream sediment sampling program using that same method. And it was quite good as well. We could see that around the Connish area, that's, that's an anomalous streams coming from there. Um, and over the sort of wider area, the Ben Oodley anomaly, we can see draining from all around Ben Oodley, there's anomalous stream sediment samples. And that's quite good as well because the company before has done drilling in the area and had lots of anomalous results come up from sampling. So we're just kind of confirming that this is a good technique and it's working and it's showing us that there's mineralization where we know there's mineralization. And it means that we can roll this out over our wider option areas uh, and find hopefully another deposit. So because we can see Ben Oodley's numbers there, we did another soil sampling. Um, this little black box here, this kind of denotes the previous area of work that's been done. That's sort of where they've done drilling before and really concentrated. Um, but again, we did a smaller survey and then we're getting these anomalies appearing off the edge. So we're kind of following them down. Um, and that was kind of expected from the stream sediments being so anomalous all around. We're also seeing this kind of preferential orientation that you saw as well in the last picture at Connellish. We're seeing this sort of northeast, southwest um, orientation of um, mineralization. So that it could be that there's a preferential orientation for mineralization in the Tyndrum area. Yeah, and here's a nice, nice picture of the top of Ben Udley looking south. Um, also, just to say that having this as much data as possible is really great over an area like Ben Udley because the geology, geology is very complicated. There is lots of faults. There's several veins, both outcropping at surface and faults that you can't quite see. And there's cliff edges where you can see a bit and um, all these brown bits here are lamprophires as well. So it's not exactly clear what influence the lamprophires are having on the veins and faults. Maybe they are something to do with the mineralization. Another area that we've been really looking at is Invercorican. Um, again, this is an area in the past that's quite interesting and been flagged up as anomalous by um, Enix International as well as Scott Gold. Uh, interestingly about this prospect is you, the way the mineralization is going is still that northeast southwest orientation and that's the same orientation as the Tyndrum Fault. The Tyndrum Fault actually comes straight through here so it might be that this mineralization is directly associated with the faulting. Um, so we have done stream sediment sampling along here uh, the stream sediment was very high here, which you can see is backed up by the soil sampling. We've had a little bit of a lag off here, which it could be expected from the stream sediment sampling, but we're going to extend this down here because if it's to be believed, it could get quite good again like it is over here. Um, a lot of grab channel and short drill holes in this area have kind of backed up as well. Like We do know there's gold there. It's just how much of it. Something else to note about this image as well is before... Um, if you look at the colours, it's measured as uh, gold to a background level. So I've calculated a background because it's not the case that the soil has no gold in at all. In a lot of cases, the background, there is a background level of gold in the soil. 
uh, in parts per billion. So I've sort of scaled it so you can see how anomalous it is. And in the previous one, it's sort of 20 times more anomalous than background was sort of hovering around the Connage deposit. But here you really have to scale it back because um, you're seeing more than 174 times the background level at uh, Invercorican. And there could be a few reasons for this. That could be because the mineralization is really close to the surface, or it could be because there is just a lot more gold. Not too sure at this point in time. So what does that mean for the future? Um, we just got to keep going, really. We've got a lot of area to cover. So first of all, the first phase is drainage sampling, and that's identifying regions of interest. Once we find those streams that look interesting, that means we can go up them, we can map them. Is there a vein there? Is there some gold popping out of the side of the hill? Um, if we can find something and we see that there's an orientation to the vein, we can then apply some soil sampling to it and see um, what the extent of it is if it really is, see how wide it is. Is it just sort of a one-off or is it actually quite a wide area that could be mineralized? After that, we can go further uh, and we can apply geophysical surveys. So that's things like induced polarization surveys, um, which measures the chargeability and the resistivity of the rocks beneath your feet. Um, and that can help us understand the geometries of the subsurface structures. So we can maybe see what angle the vein is dipping in or again, how, how large something could be underneath. Um, and that helps us to uh, get good drill targets because then we have all this information and we can have a really informed idea of where we might be drilling and hopefully have a much better success in hitting something. So at the moment, we've got this, um, we've got anomalies around Connish and we've got Ben Udley and we've got Invercorican that we're sort of quite a way through this stage with getting towards drilling. Um, and the idea is now to bring up a few more prospects to the sort of later stages of exploration and hopefully increase our chances of finding another Connish. Um, and that's about all I have to say. So thank you very much for listening.